Morals are for men, not gods. To boldly go where no man has gone before. The Enterprise is tracking the signal of a lost ship. At the edge of the galaxy, they find an object and beam it aboard, and hey, it's Scotty! Finally, we get to see the ship's chief engineer. On the way to the bridge, Kirk and Spock are joined in the turbo lift by Gary Mitchell, the Enterprise's first officer. Wait, you might be saying, isn't Spock the first officer? Well, I- I'll get to that. The department heads gather on the bridge and were introduced to a recent addition to the crew, a psychiatrist named Elizabeth Daner. With as much insanity that happens on a starship, a ship's counselor seems like a wise installation. Mitchell makes a rather crude remark about Daner breeding, and she cuts him down. Walking freezer unit. Decoding memory. The recorder's logs reveal that before the lost ship was destroyed, the captain had been researching extrasensory perception. Suddenly, the Enterprise encounters some sort of force field, control panels start exploding, and something odd happens to both Daner and Mitchell, making them collapse. Epilepsy warning at about the 9.15 mark. When Kirk checks on Mitchell, his eyes have changed to tinfoil contacts. It turns out that whatever passed through Mitchell and Daner passed through other people on the ship with high ESP capabilities. Daner has a high capacity for it, and Mitchell's ESP levels are the highest of the whole crew. Kirk and Spock are concerned that whatever has passed through the espers could make them a danger to the ship, but Daner dismisses it. Kirk comes to see Mitchell in sick bay, and they chat about their days at Starfleet Academy. Apparently, Jim and Gary are old friends. Mitchell gives us some backstory on Kirk. He was a stack of books with legs in school, that Kirk was actually a student professor, and that once he set Kirk up with a little blonde lab technician that Kirk almost married. Mitchell then starts reading way faster than humanly possible, and Kirk and Spock get more worried. Better be good to me. And you better be nice to me. Meanwhile, Dr. Daner has been assigned to observe Mitchell, and she becomes fascinated with both the changes Mitchell is exhibiting and Mitchell himself. He implies that what's happening to him is going to happen to her, too. When the senior officers reveal that Mitchell's been toying with the ship's controls telepathically, Dana is a little too defensive of him. Kirk and Spock get into an argument about what to do about Mitchell. Spock believes that he's lost his humanity and is a threat to the ship. He urges Kirk to kill Mitchell, to which Kirk responds, At least act like you've got a heart. They decide to strand Mitchell on an empty mining station, but Mitchell already knows what they're planning. He fights back as they try to force him onto the transporter and they knock him out. Wait, how is he standing upright? On the station, they put Mitchell in a force field. He touches it and it momentarily weakens him, showing a glimpse of his humanity. It's clear what a toll it's taking on Jim to see his friends being slowly taken from him bit by bit and having to betray the parts of Gary that are still left. As the crew sets up a last resort self-destruct mechanism to destroy both the station and Mitchell, should he escape, Mitchell uses his powers to kill another officer. Daner claims that she wants to stay on the station with Mitchell, now completely under his thrall. Mitchell overpowers the force field, and Daner makes her final transformation into an esper. Kirk orders the rest of the crew to go back aboard the ship and stays behind to take out Mitchell himself. Mitchell and Daner plot to start a whole new race of espers together, a very obvious conceit to Adam and Eve, including apples. Mitchell mockingly makes a grave for Kirk and gets his middle initial wrong on the headstone. Kirk appeals to what's left of Daner's humanity to help him stop Mitchell. She comes to her senses and weakens Mitchell with her powers just long enough for Kirk to kill him. Gary, forgive me. Daner, weakened from fighting Mitchell, dies as well. It feels a little gauche to make this joke, but... Back on the ship, Kirk is mourning his old friend and Spock comforts him. Episode over. While writing the script, I felt like I'd been here just a few weeks ago. Omnipotent being turns evil and tries to take over the ship. But what distinguishes Charlie X from this episode is the fact that we see Gary lose his humanity, rather than being a creepy weirdo from the get-go. Charlie also didn't have any pre-existing relationships with anyone on the Enterprise. The emotional draw of the episode is Kirk's pain at losing his friend. It's interesting that ESP is a real trait in the Star Trek universe, a subject usually only broached on conspiracy theory type shows like The X-Files. I suppose ESP would have to be real considering that there are telepathic alien races like the Vulcans. The ways in which Star Trek pushes the boundaries of science fiction are intriguing to consider. For instance, the citizens of the planet Bajor from Deep Space Nine worship a group of gods they call the Prophets, who turn out to be real. But are they really gods or just highly advanced aliens? Star Wars has a similar question when it comes to the Force, an energy that certain individuals have the power to channel and manipulate and is basically magic, midichlorians notwithstanding. So then does Star Wars fall into the category of fantasy? And then there are fictional universes like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, where the lines between science fiction and fantasy are blurred. Your ancestors called it magic, and you call it science. Well, I come from a place where they're one and the same thing. As Arthur C. Clarke's third law states, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. This won't be the last time we'll broach the topic of gods or magic in this series either. You might be thinking that my calling Gary a f- 
Boy is harsh. After all, he doesn't seem all bad. Jim seems to like him well enough. But we tend to forgive our friends' flaws. I myself am a staunch leftist, and one of my best friends voted for Donald Trump. Most of what we see of Gary is through Kirk's eyes. But there is still the breeding remark. Well, I'm proving the breed, Doctor. Is that your line? So the question becomes, did the Esper powers corrupt Gary, or was he already rotten? After all, Elizabeth is tempted by the powers, but retains her humanity long enough to help Jim fight Gary. God is all-powerful. He cannot be all-good. And if he is all-good, then he cannot be all-powerful. That's a partially mangled quote by Greek philosopher Epicurus, by the way. Alright, so it's time to address the production thing. Why are the uniforms so crappy? Why is Spock in command gold when he's not even the first officer? Who the hell is this guy? Where's Bones? And where is Uhura? When Gene Roddenberry initially pitched Star Trek to the NBC executives in 1965, he initially put together a pilot episode called The Cage, starring Jeffrey Hunter as the captain of the Enterprise Christopher Pike, Majel Barrett as the first officer, and John Hoyt as the ship's doctor. It was rejected, so Roddenberry went back to the drawing board, and and writer Samuel Peoples devised the premise and script for a second pilot, where no man has gone before, with an almost entirely new cast. I'll go more into detail about the cage in a later video. You can see the pains of Star Trek trying to figure itself out. The uniforms are reused from the cage, and you can see the members of the Antares wearing them in Charlie X, and the cast we know and love isn't 100% set in stone. The most telling aspect of production pains is Leonard Nimoy's performance. He plays Spock as more emotive in the pilot than he does later on, openly showing amusement, annoyance, excitement, and worry. This is probably left over from The Cage, where Nimoy plays Spock as downright jolly. He clearly hadn't quite figured out how to balance Vulcan stoicism with Spock's human side yet. Jim even makes a joke about Spock's feelings in the opening scene. I'm certain you don't know what irritation is? In fact, Spock's human emotions are treated as something of a small character arc in the episode, and a microcosm of his overall arc throughout the entire original series and its subsequent movies. Spock acts insensitive to Jim's pain, for which Jim chastises him. At the end, however, Spock offers Jim sympathy, which, for Spock, it shows significant growth. Thematically speaking, Spock is Gary's replacement, both as first officer and as Jim's new best friend. If we look at Where No Man as the first episode of Star Trek like it was intended, we might see this scene like the end of Casablanca, with two unlikely friends sauntering off to their next adventure together. I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. It's basically a miracle that this episode, and Star Trek as a whole, exists, considering how much trouble it had taking off. But here we are, over 50 years later, and as one of my favorite rednecks likes to say, we are still here.